Hi, this is Dr. Marshall, and this is the um, third part of the discussion of compounds, basic compound structure, nomenclature. Um, we've talked about how uh, bonds form, both ionic and covalent bonds. We've talked about how they form. We've talked about how to create formulas for ionic compounds. Um, and now we need to talk about how to name ionic compounds and covalent compounds and also figure out how to get formulas from the names of ionic compounds. Okay, so now that we've figured out how to begin creating formulas for ionic compounds, we need to start being able to name them. Remember that the formulas for ionic compounds have two components. Okay, we have a left component and a right component. Okay, that's the most basic thing. We have two components to the formula, a left component and a right component and you should relate this to the periodic table we have a left side of the periodic table and a right side of the periodic table so that the left component is the metal the right component is the non-metal and because metals give up electrons to non-metals and we can also get that from the periodic table too right things flow in a left to right direction so metals give up electrons to non-metals and when metals give up electrons they become positive and the right side thing becomes negative and then we give a special name to the left side thing we call it the cation so when we create a cation we create a positive ion from a metal it's the cation and remember we said we could uh, remember that by the phrase cat paws okay now p-a-w-s for pause uh, uh, is a, a reminder that cations are positive and then for anions, we said that we could remember that these were negative because Anakin Skywalker was negative. Okay, that's how I figure it out. Now, when naming ionic compounds, the name of the cation is always first. Sorry about that. I recognized that the, the name cation hadn't been inserted into the answer for that yet. Um, so for the cation, as we hopefully have learned by now, this will virtually always be an element, okay? The left thing will almost always be an element. The one exception for our purposes will be when the formula starts with the polyatomic ion, the ammonium ion, which is NH4. And NH4 is the only polyatomic ion. So on the left side, the first thing you will see is either a single element symbol like sodium or magnesium or rubidium or calcium okay or you might see the nh4 and um, so the the first step in our naming strategy then is to find out if the first component of our formula is simply an element or the single exception the nh4 iron if the first component is just an element then the first component of the name is just the name of the element. And then what could be easier than that, right? All I have to do is write down the name of that first element, unless it's NH4, in which case I have to write down ammonium. Okay, so if the first component is the ammonium ion, then consider the name of uh, the first component to be ammonium. Okay, so to illustrate this, we've got um, this list of uh, compound formulas here. And all we're going to do is just do what the first step says. Write down the name of the first component. So in this first compound here, magnesium sulfide, the first component is magnesium This is what you should be writing down on your list. First component here, aluminum. First component here, mercury. First component, tin. First component, notice these are just element symbols. The first symbol here, iron. Fe, iron. 
Now, here's our first example of the ammonium ion, NH4. So the only exception to it just being an element is this. And when I see NH4, I write down ammonium. Lead, sodium, copper, silver, and then the NH4 or ammonium. Okay, so, oops, we've got a few more, don't we? Um, potassium, just that first letter there, right? When I see another capital letter, that means the second component is starting. So Al, aluminum, lead, and tin. Okay, so that's all there is to it, the first name. And if you can write down just that first name, you'll get a quarter of the points uh, for that particular uh, problem. Okay, so let's go back to, and let's, we don't want to save that. Let's go. Okay, so we're back in our notes here. And so we've got the first step taken care of. Now, the second step is to determine if the first component is an element and not the ammonium ion, is it a metal that came from one of the A columns or is it a transition metal that came from one of the B columns? Okay, and let's remind ourselves, I'm just going to open up our periodic table here. Um, we remind ourselves, so if it's a metal, it's from this A1 or A2 or A3 or A4, A5, A6 column, or is it from the middle part here, this transition area? And we need to know if it's in, from an A column or a B column. Um, that's annoying. Okay, so uh, right here, for example, if I'm magnesium, I'm in column 2A, and I own. If it is an a, a metal in one of the A columns, we'll say for now that the cation can only have one charge. Remember, we talked about the idea that one of the reasons that the, uh, the, uh, the transition elements were so complex or so uh, not well understood by most people is that they do things that are not consistent, okay? Uh, whereas those things in the A columns always or almost always just give up a certain number of electrons or interact in a certain way. Things in the B columns can give up a certain number of electrons, but they don't always. So we have to um, make some um, considerations for that. So remember, however, that because a transition element can give up different amounts of valence electrons depending on the circumstances, we have to say which charge we're talking about for that particular transition element when we name the compound. Okay, so uh, the number given up in a particular situation is usually shown by a Roman numeral when writing the name of the element or the compound containing the element. For example, I have two different forms of the same compound. I have iron oxide that has two iron atoms combined with three oxygen atoms, or I have iron oxide with one iron atom combined with one oxygen atom. And the difference is that in the first one here, the iron has a three plus charge. It's given up three valence electrons. And in the second situation, it's given up two valence electrons. And I can't just call them both iron oxide without saying which one it is. So for the one with a three plus charge, I'll call it iron 3 with a Roman numeral 3 here. And the second one I'll call iron 2 with a Roman numeral 2. So we have to know how 
we get this. We have to know, well, how do we know that in the first case the charge is 3 plus and in the second case it's 2 plus? We can't just use the periodic table to tell us this like we can for A columns because it the uh, B columns just tell us how many they could give up, not how many they do give up. Okay, so uh, we have these different circumstances. So the actual number given up might be and often is less than how many they could give up. So again, the number of the B column is just a guide to tell us how many electrons they could give up. The actual number of electrons and the actual charge has to be determined from the formula itself. So if I'm naming a compound and I've been given the formula, I can figure out what this Roman numeral is from the formula. So let's walk through that. Okay, so for the iron 3 oxide, For the iron 3 oxide, notice that there are three oxygens, okay, Fe2O3. You know that each of these oxygens has a charge of negative 2. So write that underneath the symbol for the oxygen, okay. So each of these three oxygens has a negative 2 charge. And this means that the total number of negative charges for this formula is negative 6, right? If I have three negative twos, three times negative two is negative six. This means that the total number of positive charges also has to be positive six. Okay, so write this underneath the positive ion and the uh, total number of positive charges has to balance the total number of negative charges. So now we can figure out which charge on each of the ion um, there should be. So now we can figure out what the charge on each ion should be as there are two of these. Are there two of the iron ions? Uh, each iron has to have a charge of plus three in order to get a total of six positive charges. So since I've got six positive charges, I can reason that if I have two irons and I need six positive charges, each one has to have a three plus charge. Therefore, we use a Roman numeral three for the name of this compound, iron three oxide. Okay, we want to do the same thing for iron two oxide. Okay, just to show this, notice that there's just one oxygen in this formula. Okay, I don't have a subscript, so there's just one oxygen. And you also know that this oxygen has a minus 2 charge. So we're going to write that underneath the oxygen symbol. This means that the total number of negative charges, since I just have 1 minus 2, I only have a total of 2 negative charges here as opposed to 6 from last time. So this means that the total number of positive charges also has to be 2. So finally, we can also then figure out what the charge on the single iron atom should be. As there's only one iron here, right? I don't have a subscript. It has to have a charge of 2 plus in order to provide a total charge of 2 plus charges. So a Roman numeral 2 is used in the name of this compound, iron 2 oxide. If the anion component of the formula is a polyatomic ion, the correct charge to use to figure out the charge on the cation has to be looked up in the polyatomic ion table or be memorized. <clears throat> so go back to the list above now and for each element that is in an A column do nothing else uh, to the first component of the name but if the element is a transition metal figure out what the charge on it is and designate that charge with the correct Roman numeral in parentheses and then click here to make sure you have the right answers. To illustrate this though, we're going to have to go to uh, another video. I'm out of time on this one. It's reached its 15 minutes, so we'll stop it and go to the next video.